Yeah, I, I grew up in poverty. I was raised by a single dad with six kids. And I just remember that money was always so tight. We never had enough. And I just remember thinking over and over again that when I got older, I didn't want to live like this. I didn't want to be poor. You're listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their current portfolio allocation. Now to your hosts, Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast. This is episode number 149. Clark, how you doing? What's going on in your world? Good, doing well. Not much. We had a few interviews last night. Another couple of fun interviews. Interviewed uh, Dave Ramsey, C- what, COO, right? Yeah, former COO. Or former COO. Was with Dave Ramsey about 15 years. So that was an interesting interview about yeah. what it's like to work for him and some of his allocation and net worth. So pr- that was a pretty interesting interview, I thought. Yeah, no, it's great. We got a ton of good ones in the pipeline and can't wait. You know, every single one of these, even the one today, super excited about. Uh, you know, it's going to be, her name's Jackie. She's a single mom, just recently retired at 49 from corporate America. Net worth is 1.3 million. She's got about 700K split in her, in her 401k between four mutual funds. She has about 215,000 in a single stock portfolio consisting of Apple, Berkshire, and Abbott and some other stocks and about 120,000 in some home equity. Last week, we had Nathan. He's an entrepreneur with a net worth of over $1 million. He's pretty frugal, buys used cars, and has no mortgage. He started several of his companies with less than $5,000, and about 30% of his allocation is in the stock market. And he recently invested in an Opportunity Zone fund after the sale of one of his companies. So it's an interesting episode with him. That's episode number 149. If you're interested, go check that out. We were just talking a little bit before the show about consumption spending. Clark, have you ever looked at your finances through the lens of consumption spending? Well, it was a new term. You know, you mentioned it and I looked it up. I'm like, what is consumption smoothing? And I came across this in Investopedia article or in definition, I guess. So for anyone who doesn't know consumption smoothing, I didn't. It says consumption smoothing is the practice of optimizing our standard of living by ensuring proper balance between spending and saving during different phases of our lives. Those who overspend and put off saving for retirement to enjoy a higher standard of living often have to work longer. Those who oversave and live a more frugal lifestyle while working to enjoy a better lifestyle while retired. So pretty interesting. I mean, I think we all try to manage it to the best of our ability, right? We talked about this a few episodes ago when we were talking about Bill Perkins and the ability to have experiences and how certain experiences are meant for different times in your life. And there's things you'll do now and be more interested in that you won't do later, right? So I think that ties into consumption smoothing a little bit, right? If we're just talking about what's the correct amount to save, right? What's the correct amount to put put away? And people that are doing fire, right, and want to retire early, they're going to put a whole lot more away now than maybe somebody else will who says, hey, I'd rather enjoy a little bit of it now than have to work a little bit longer, right? Yeah, totally. And it, you know, it kind of makes you think in terms of consumption spending, maybe the way that we think about budgeting and stuff, maybe we look at budgets in segments of our life and maybe we look at allocating you know, resources down the road from our, let's just say the decade of our 80s. What does that look like? What are we going to need? What do we think we're going to need? And then maybe go into the 70s and kind of back into it and maybe, you know, allocate funds, resources, budget differently based on how we think that we're going to, you know, essentially have this consumption spending, you know, and try to get to that optimal utility of of money or usage of money throughout our lives. I think a lot of our millionaires come on and they have these these goals and these plans to get to some some point, we've been more and more asking uh, millionaires, you know, if there's something they regretted that they didn't do when they were younger, or they wish they would have. And a lot of times it is, hey, I wish I would have saved a little bit more. But now we're starting to see some, now that we've asked some different questions lately, where maybe they did regret not taking that vacation or they regretted, uh, you know, doing something they should have scheduled or, you know, and spent, spent more money or more time working versus spending it on experiences or something. Yeah, and you think about different stages of life, right? I mean, we know, okay, later in your career, probably in what, your 40s or 50s is your peak time earning potential, right, in your career if you're going for a long career or even if you're doing something entrepreneurial where you build up the money, you build up time, you have some experiences, you have more contacts, right? 
but you also have more expenses in your 30s and 40s as you have kids and then you're saving for college education and we just I mean we just talked to a guy who spends seventy thousand dollars a year on private education for his kids right yep. so your earning potential goes up but so do your expenses most likely yeah Different, totally yes if you don't have kids or whatever right there can be different situations but I think that's something to think about too and and I think sometimes when we just say, hey, I'm going to save 15%, I don't know if that's always the best advice because right now, right, I have fewer expenses because I don't have kids. In 10 years when I have kids, hopefully, right, the expenses are going to go up. Yeah, totally. So a shift of thinking in a way as as you move through different parts of your life. Yeah, it's definitely something that I'm going to try to consider and, and maybe move more into the segmenting decades of my life uh, per se and thinking about the the consumption spending in a different light than maybe I have in the past. Anyway, we appreciate y'all tuning in the podcast week after week. If you enjoy the show, we'd appreciate you leaving a five-star review on either iTunes or Stitcher. Helps us to continue to grow the the show and reach new millionaire interviewees. Also, if you're interested, we've got several multifamily opportunities in the pipeline. Reach out to us at millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. Without any further delay, let's get in the episode with Jackie. Jackie, do you want to just give us a little bit about your background and what you're up to now? Yeah, um, I am originally from the South, and now I live in uh, the uh, Northeast part of the U.S. I am a single mom. I have one adult daughter. She's 24 years old, and I actually just retired from corporate America. I retired at 49, and uh, that didn't happen overnight, uh, so I have quite a journey and things that I had to overcome in order to get there. But I worked for corporate America. Um, The last job I had, I was there for about 21 years. And um, I was just so ready to retire, even though I loved my job. But I have this big, audacious dream of creating a financially literate society. So that was my big goal um, for why I wanted to retire so early. So here I am. That's awesome. And what is your net worth today? My net worth is $1.3 million. And how is that broken up? Okay. Well, the biggest part of that, again, I worked for corporate America most of my life. And 700000 of that is in my 401k. And the way I allocate that, I have like four different mutual funds. And, you know, it's in a 401k. So you only get, you know, a certain list that you can choose from. Uh, now, since I'm retired, I probably will roll that over. And the next largest pot would be my traditional IRA. I've got 215000 in there. And that is an account where I actually have a single stock portfolio. And some of my top holdings in there is like Apple, Berkshire Hathaway, I have Abbott Labs. So uh, that's done well for me. But uh the overwhelming majority of my assets is in uh, just broad-based mutual funds, but I do enjoy analyzing great companies. And uh, so I do have some uh, individual stocks that I own. Uh, the next one is my, uh, I have about $120,000 in home equity. Uh, when I retired, I definitely sort of weighed, you know, should I pay the house off? Should I not? I decided not to. The interest rate was very, very low. And now that money is just still working in the stock market. Now, probably the most efficient, the most tax efficient account that I have is my health savings account. So that has grown to about $140,000. So I started mine way back in the day as soon as my company started offering them. And that is just straight up um, a total stock market index fund. I think it's VTSAX that I have that. And then... um, Right before I retired, I took about 15% and I put that in cash. I have a Roth IRA as well, um, which is uh, some of the money that I plan on using early on after I retire. That's about 100000 And then I have some little things like my company pension. Uh, when we had one, uh, they froze it about 10 years after I uh, started there. That's about 60000 And then I'm a part of a stock investment club. And my share of that um, investment club is about 30000 So th- that's kind of how it's broken out. 
That's awesome. I want to get into a couple of those points that, that you made. I don't know that we've had somebody on with that much in an HSA. How did that yeah, yeah how did that come about and why did you did you decide to allocate it like you did? Okay. So that one is pretty interesting. Um, but and I do know that it's very unusual to have that much in a health savings account. So for me, so it was me and my daughter and the first time my company started authoring, offering these, it was right around 2008, 2009. So that'll, uh, that uh, answers the question about how it grew so fast because it was in that 10-year bull market. But aside from that, I was on a family high deductible plan, which allowed me to make the family contributions. All you need is you and one other person. And I max it out every year. And when I was first introduced to these high deductible health plans and a health savings account, I was very skeptical and I really didn't understand. I thought they were the same as like a flexible spending account where you lose the money, you know, they use it or lose it. But it rolled over from year to year. And then when I knew that I could invest in it, it's like I was sold because my daughter and I were very healthy and we were barely, we never even made the met the low deductible that we had. Like if the deductible was $500, you know, I probably didn't even spend, you know, a couple hundred dollars a year for me and my daughter. So it was the right plan for us. And so over 10 year period, I maxed it out. I invested in um, a total stock market um, index fund and it grew um, to $140,000. And I think I had it for right at 11 years. And the reason why I love this account so much is because it lowered my taxable income in the beginning. The premiums was much lower than the traditional plans. And then once the money got into the health savings account, I was able to invest it. And also I got contributions from my employer. And so it is growing tax-free. And then when I'm ready to take it out, that's tax-free. And still my daughter and I have very low healthcare needs. And I hardly have any expenses that I need to cover with that health savings account. And in the beginning, it was a little tricky, right? Because I didn't know, you know, if I would need it or not, or if something catastrophic would happen. But once I got two or three years in and it had grown so much, it really sort of eased any anxiety that I had. So that's kind of how it grew to that much. That's amazing. And have you pulled out of it at all for anything? No, but you know what? I have held on to receipts. So the re- I, any mm-hmm. expenses that we've had during that 11-year period, I've held on to the receipts and I can reimburse myself at any time. There's no time limit. So awesome. that's kind of a piece of my, yeah. So there's just so many different benefits to having that account. And I didn't really know all the um, benefits from the beginning. And I just started learning as I went because no one was really writing about it. There was not a lot of information early on. I mean, now there's a lot of stuff. And then um, I read that great article by the mad scientist calling the HSA the ultimate retirement account. And that's truly how I ended up using it. Yeah, that's awesome. So Jackie, I want to I want to talk more about that and your allocation and the numbers and kind of and get into the nitty gritty. But I also want to hear your story of who's Jackie. So You shared with us you're an African-American single mom. You grew up in poverty, right? Tell us a little bit about your story, how you started learning about all this financial stuff, because you're obviously very savvy in it. Tell us your story or give us a quick background on who Jackie is. Well, I'm getting getting there with the savviness and finances. But um, yeah, I, I grew up in poverty. I was raised by a single dad with six kids. And I just remember that money was always so tight. We never had enough. And it was very hard to grow up that way, even though my dad worked his butt off. Like, I don't even know how he was able to raise six kids by himself. And I just remember thinking over and over again that when I got older, I didn't want to live like this. I didn't want to be poor. So one of the first things that I did that I knew would kind of get me on the right path was I decided to go to college. I was already always pretty good in high school. So I knew I would be able to get in. Um, You know, I couldn't go to some fancy college or whatever, because whatever the cost was, it was coming out of my pocket. So I went to like a, a, a local school 
And, you know, I paid my own way by working full time. Uh, and, and when I started college, I was um, 18. But right before I went to college, actually right before I graduated from high school, um, my dad passed away of cancer. So I had that to oh, deal with. So but yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it was tough. You know, it's been a long time. And now I look at it like, you know, <laughs> we all have a mission on this earth. And I feel like his mission was to raise his kids. Like we were all, uh, you know, my youngest sister was 17 years old at the time. So he mm. had done his mission here on this earth. But even before he passed away, I knew that that going to college was 100 percent my responsibility financially and otherwise. Like I didn't have anyone holding my hand saying, you know, come and study for the, uh, you know, the the SAT back then, that's the exam that we had to take to get into school. Nobody was telling me you should take these classes or that classes because I was a first generation college graduate. So I had no Good for one. You. Uh, Good yeah, for you. thank you. Um, so, so yeah, so I just, you know, I just knew that doing that would put me in in a position to where I would be able to get a better job and a better salary again, so that I would not be poor. And I, that was like the one thing I was running so hard away from. And so when I was in college, I worked full time the entire time and sometimes two jobs. I mean, there were most of the time I was probably working at least 50 hours a week and I was still taking a full load at school because, you know, that's what everybody else did. So I was taking three to four classes and working 50 hours a week. And so as, as good as of a student, I was, you know, working that much and taking a full load, just something had to give. And what the thing that gave was my grades. And even though I struggled to get through school. I did manage to get my degree, but I knew I didn't do as well as I was academically capable of doing. So I was always disappointed in that, but I got my degree and I said, you know what, hopefully I'll never have to look at that GPA again. And (laughs) I've got my diploma and the GPA is not on my diploma. So um, my first job out of college, I had already been working for Walmart at a local Walmart store uh, where I live. And when I graduated college, I ended up getting a job in communications at Walmart headquarters in Bentonville, Arkansas. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, not exactly, you know, the place on the map that I was wanting to go, but it was a job. And there was a lot of friends of mine that couldn't find a job in their field. So for for me moving away, you know, I didn't have anyone driving me or anyone moving my stuff. I mean, Walmart back then, they gave you a U-Haul truck and you can hook your car on the back, put all your stuff in the truck and you had to drive to wherever you were moving to. So I was happy to just get that. But I did that all by myself. And that was probably one of the hardest things I had to do. And I broke my trip up into two days, but man, it was so tough. I I was so scared to drive that big Mm. truck. I was so scared to have my car on the back. Uh, So it was, it was scary, but I could see, I could see the, you know, my, my world and my economics, you know, moving up. And I felt like, okay, this is the one thing that's going to help put me firmly in the middle class. Like that's what I aspired to be. I just wanted to be in the middle class. And, and, uh, you know, once I got to Arkansas, you know, I, I worked at the headquarters for like three or four years. I ended up getting married and ended up uh, moving away with my husband. And I, I had my daughter and, uh, you know, we were a big, happy family for about 11 years. And then um, I ended up getting a divorce and that put me, you know, in another tailspin where, you know, I had to, you know, shift again, you know, I had to, you know, realize that now my life is changing, uh, could be for the worst. And I don't, and, and again, I kept thinking, I don't want to be back in poverty. I don't want this to cause me to not succeed. And so that's when I think I kind of, you know, after, you know, getting over that emotionally and otherwise, uh, I would say it took about two years. That's when the tide started to turn. And I really, really wanted to just go really hard for making a good life for me, making a good life for my daughter. And that was my main motivator financially um, at that time. And I think that kind of started it off. 
Were you still, were you still, sorry to interrupt you. Were you still working at that time for those 11 years or had you stopped working? No, absolutely. I worked the entire time. Um, you know, the way that I grew up, you know, you, you just always work. Like I have never not worked in my whole life since I was 16. So even when I was married, I worked full time. You know, I had my daughter, took my maternity leave. I went back to work and, and I do remember I got laid off from my job. And I'd never been let go from a job before. So this was so different mm. for me. But when, even when I got laid off, though, I was married and my husband, you know, we were both making a decent salary. So I probably could have been a stay home mom, but that wasn't who I was. So I had to go back to work. And I think I was out of work for like six weeks and I got a job, you know, after six weeks. And okay. incidentally, that's with the company that I'm at, that I was at before I retired. So I was there for 21 years. So it worked oh, out. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you have a, when you were after your father passed and you, you said you were 18? Yeah, I was 18. Did you have a, I guess you had uh, what is that? Four older siblings, right? Yeah, did, I, did one of them help mentor you? Did you have a friend or a church group? Was there anyone that you could go to or did you were you just figuring it out on your own? I was figuring out on my own because really everyone around me was also in poverty, mostly no one went to college, you know, no one was investing in the stock market. I wasn't seeing anyone that was different than how I grew up. Now I had five siblings. Again, I was the first one that went to college. So I didn't have anyone in my immediate family or anyone that I knew that could sort of even guide me through that whole college entrance process or the college experience. So I just had to just figure it all out myself. How did you have that that mindset of that growth mindset, Jackie? Because I, I think about it with all of us, right? You, you hear that quote of you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Right. And, and whether it's in school, right, spending it around kids that aren't studying or aren't taking things seriously or around a sports team or, you know, whatever the situation be, I think you can make the analogy on many things. But growing up in, in poverty and people not being, like you just said, as motivated to get out, how were you? What, how did you get over that? Yeah, you know, I've thought about that question a million times because me and all my siblings, we all grew up in the same household, was in the same environment. So I, I've wondered a lot, you know, why did I think different enough to at least go to college or to at least, you know, be willing to move away? And the only thing I can say is that I was willing to get out of my comfort zone. And at the time, I didn't realize how powerful that was because when I was driving that big U-Haul truck, you know, to Arkansas, I like literally was in tears because I didn't mm. know what I was going to do. I mean, I barely had enough money to, you know, pay a deposit on my apartment, to pay a deposit on the utilities. Um, I mean, it was just that bad. And then the student loans were due and I didn't have a ton of student loans because I worked most of the time, but I did have some. How much did it's you have? I'm thinking it was around $20,000. It was something reasonable. I never remember like choking on it or feeling like, you know, yeah, it's I still couldn't. a good chunk though, right? It takes you a year or two to pay it off. Well, and I, and at the time that it seemed like a lot to me at the time. And when it was due, when I didn't have it, then it was a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, when I look back on it, 20,000 and compared to the student loan debts that are out there today, it doesn't right. seem like all I know is it would have been a lot more if I wasn't working while I was in school. Right, right. So then how did the how did the saving and investing start? Well, I think that kind of started. Oh, you know what? When I was going through a divorce. So when you get divorced and hopefully you guys never have to go through a divorce. But when you go through a divorce, they look at all the retirement money and they basically put it in one pot and you split it down the middle. So you look at these two accounts. Now, both my husband and I were making about the same salary and we were getting about the same company match. I think it was 6%. So when I looked at my 401k, I had $20,000 in there. And at the time I was about 30, 35, 36. So I'm thinking, oh yeah, I'm doing pretty good, right? Well, my husband and his 401k, he had $120,000 and I had <laughs> no idea that this big disparity existed. So how did he get $120,000 in his account? And I only had 20,000. So that was definitely, you know, a pivotal moment for me. 
and the realization that he had so much more than me just boggled my mind. And I never got the answer of why, because, you know, it could have been a number of different things. Obviously, he was probably putting more money in his account, or maybe he had different investments, who knows. But I just remember telling myself, I never want to be this financially ignorant ever again. I'm going to learn how to invest. I'm going to, you know, supercharge my savings and I'm going to make sure this does not happen again. So that's when, um, so again, it took a couple of years because, you know, going through divorce is just absolutely devastating, both on your finances and emotionally, you know, because your whole life is now on a whole different trajectory. So one of the first things that I did when I kind of woke up, I joined this investment club because I had been talking to a friend, a friend of mine. Uh, she was a coworker, but she was in Boston and I was in a different city. And she was telling me about this organization called Better Investing. They support investment clubs and they're nonprofit. And she says, oh, I'm sure there's one in your area. So she said, you should just Google it. So I Googled it. And um, there indeed was um, a club. And it was called a model club. And that just meant that they were open to the public. So I was attracted to that, that I could just observe. And these people were talking about individual companies, the analysis that they were doing, you know, PE ratios and talking about, you know, growing <laughs> sales. And I'm like, wow, these people are so smart. Right. And, but right. on top of that, they were super nice. So this is probably one of the early values I got from community. So I think that's what mainly it was about. And the clubs were mostly focusing on education, but it was also community because these were like-minded people. They were interested in investing as well. So after going to like four or five meetings and, you know, whenever I could, I decided I wanted to join and I'm still a member of that club today and, and very involved in the organization. So that is probably what kicked it all off. Gosh, so interesting. Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask you about that stock investment club. So, so yeah. you have 30,000. How does that work? Everybody puts in money and then you you grow yes. it together and then split the proceeds or that, That's basically how it works. Now, there um one of the linchpins of this whole thing is having very transparent um accounting practices. So, we all have the program where we have an ID and a password and you can go on at any time and you can see what your share is. You can see what the value of the portfolio is. You can see the performance of all the holdings. You can see your individual um, performance. And so that's basically how it works. But yes, each each month, you know, each um, member uh, puts in um, so much money and, and it's very small amounts because this is mostly about education. So the minimum is like 25. The maximum is $100 a month. So this is small dollars. If someone leaves the, the, leaves the uh, club, you can you know, buy some of their shares or portion of, of that. But other mm. than that, you're, you're, you know, so the most I contributed on a monthly basis was a hundred dollars a month. But if someone left then I would, you know, sort of get as much of their part as I could. And that's how it, you know, grew to what it grew to. I think the, the overall club portfolio is probably worth just under $200,000. And it's been around for, I think like 17 years now. And I've been a part of it for about 11 years. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just curious because I think that's the first time it's been mentioned on the show. How many members in the group? Yeah. So our uh, club has, you see it fluctuates between like 15 and 18 members. Again, all people smarter than me. <laughs> so Jackie, where do you go from here? You're in school right now, you let us know, and, and you've got this great net worth. What's the plan for the future? Well, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, I thought a lot about what I wanted to do after I retired. And I don't know if I would even want to retire from my job if I didn't have a, a, a clear picture of what I wanted to do, at least a mission. So from our conversation today, you know, you, you probably gather that the whole financial literacy and financial education part was a, was very integral in my story. And I just think about, you know, all the people that I left behind, you know, all the people that are still in poverty from my neighborhood or my com community, just because they didn't know, just like I didn't know. And so I've learned all this, I've gained all this knowledge, and I couldn't imagine not sharing it with everyone else. So my dream is to create a financially literate society. And I feel like the ones that can benefit the most 
are the ones that aren't getting this information. Like it's uh, financial literacy and, and personal finance classes aren't taught in all schools. You know, there's only 21 states that require a standalone personal finance class in order to graduate. And so I want to have an impact on the world. So that's what I want my legacy to be. So even though I enjoyed my job, I liked it. I love the people I work with. I, I love my boss, but I just feel like I have a bigger mission in this world. And that's to help people with their finances and and touch as many people as I can with financial literacy so that they can move the needle like I did. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, I, I love your mission and I'm so glad you're doing. I'm glad that we could, uh, you know, be a part of it and have you on the podcast and share a little bit of that. And I got to ask, was 1 million or 1.2 or 3 or whatever, was that the goal when you kind of started your work in corporate America or was it just, hey, I'm going to continue to just put money into investments, continue to work as hard as I can since you've been working since 16? Yeah. Yeah. I, I did a lot of flailing around for a long time. I would say this whole, you know, net worth, I didn't do my first net worth statement until like maybe 2011, 2012, but it was doing a net worth statement was probably one of the most powerful exercises I've ever done. Because like you said, I was shoveling as much money as I could in my, you know, retirement accounts. And I learned a lot about taxes and how these investments work. And I was just trying to max everything out, you know, and but I I didn't know what it would add up to. You know, my idea and probably most people's idea of retiring early is what Social Security tells you it is, right? 62. Or it's what, um, you know, some of the, uh, you know, retirement account rules. You can't take money out unless you're 59 and a half. So some of us think that's early retirement. So I never imagined that it would be possible to do it in your 40s. So when I realized that, wow, you know, I don't have to wait that long. When, you know, I would consider myself a part of the fire community and the standard that they use to calculate, you know, what's your FI number is 25 times your expenses. And I never really kept a budget. The, the time that I sat down and did my budget, I actually just did it backwards, right? I just looked at everything that I was putting into savings and investments and whatever I had left, that was what I was living off of. That's how I figured out how I was what I was living off of. And that came to about, I don't know, forty to forty five thousand dollars a year. And and you know, my average income, I would say over the last 10 years was probably around eighty thousand dollars. And so I've never made over six figures, but I was living off of about forty to forty five thousand. So about half that. And I was doing it comfortably because I wasn't even trying to budget or anything. Um, I was just always very conscientious about where my money went and, and what I was spending money on. What's the most you ever made, Jackie? I think on the high end, probably like ninety five, ninety six thousand. And okay, so you got close, but never over. I, yeah, and and it really was never a big goal of mine to make over a hundred. Um, you know, when I became a single mom, I biggest priority was my daughter and making sure that she was taken care of. So there were things that I could have done. Like I was in sales and I worked mm -hmm. at my, my company's headquarters. So if I was in sales in the field, I probably could have made almost double what I was making, but that was just not the priority. I was comfortable. I had everything that I needed. I was taking care of my daughter and had, you know, everything that she needed. So, you know, that was just never a big dream of mine. And, and, I had adopted the philosophy that it's what you do with that money. So I, I, you know, in learning a lot about taxes and investments, I was just a lot more efficient with my dollars than maybe a typical person would be that maybe is even making 150000 or 200000 Just smet, Yeah, you just saved and invested it smarter. Yeah, yeah. And spent it wiser. Wow, good for you. Amazing. Really an amazing story, Jackie. Congratulations. And then you shared with us, and I know Jace just mentioned that you're getting your master's degree, but master, just for it, so our listeners know if, if it's okay to share a master's degree in personal financial planning and financial therapy. So yeah. your, money, or your money is where your mouth is, right? Yeah, so exactly. Go on to uh, teach people. Yeah. I mean, what I want to do since I retired is going to all center around financial literacy and financial education. So if it's not something focused on that, I'm probably not going to do it. 
But um, this program really spoke to me and I'm kind of uh, reclaiming, you know, my academic life because when I was an undergrad, I was just so disappointed with how I did. And to now be able to go back to school, not have to work and focus on the whole academic experience and enjoy what I'm learning. I just feel like now I've reclaimed what I have been, you know, so bothered by for a long time. And and I did just get done with my first semester with a 4.0. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Congrats. Thanks. That is great. So uh, <clears throat> this teaching, this financial literacy and, and teaching to, I guess we could say, right, people in poverty, regardless of race, right? Right, right. What's the best way to do it? Well, I think it's so many communities that are in need. And for me, you know, I I came from, you know, a a largely African-American community. But like you said, there are all races that are in poverty. There's so many um, organizations like, for instance, Junior Achievement. The NAACP uh, is is another organization I just remember that has done a lot of things, you know, for the black community specifically. Um, and then also, if you have kids or we all have schools in our neighborhood, you know, figure out what are the underserved schools in your area that could use the help. Like one thing I did, I would go into some of these, uh, they're called Title I schools. Title I schools are schools where I think a certain percentage of the students are on like uh, the free lunch program or getting some kind of assistance. So Mm -hmm. they get additional dollars from the government. So I would go into some of these schools and just teach financial literacy. Like the teachers are great. The teachers have hearts of gold and want to help these kids like everyone else. And to have someone on the outside from the community that has this expertise in financial education and can teach these kids or just play a fun game with them or, you know, whatever you want to do. I have, um, crafted a lot of my presentations and workshops around underserved populations to make sure that they're engaged, to meet them where they're at, and maybe to ask the teacher, what are they really interested in? And you know, the interesting thing, one of the the top things that they're interested in, they're interested in investing. And I'm just like, so encouraged by that. Like they want to know. Hmm. Yeah. And it, I would check around in your community because all these schools, they would love to have someone from the outside that has a special expertise. And you're and, and saying a special expertise is just maybe you just understand budgeting or you understand right. how to save. You understand compound growth, you know, share your knowledge. So anywhere I'm at, I'm wanting to teach financial literacy. So I've done so many of these sessions where now they come to me, but I pretty much started in um, high schools because I knew I knew more than they did and that they could, and they were going to that next step. Well, all this money stuff was going to hit them right in the face once they graduate Mm -hmm. and they're on Mm -hmm. their own, just like it did me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. I want to ask you real quick about your real estate, because I know you dabbled in that and you mentioned that in your initial email to us. Tell us a little bit about that story, because obviously it went well, but you decided not to do real estate going forward. Yeah, yeah. So you're the real estate guys. I feel like everyone should try their hand at real estate because it could it's one of those areas that could make you uber successful. And there are some great returns that you can get from real estate, which is why I tried it. Okay. So this was back in, it was a window of opportunity, right? So it was back in 2009 when everything was rock bottom. Now I didn't have a million dollars at the time, but I kind of wanted to take advantage of some of these deals. And there was, um, uh, this was in South Carolina. It was kind of near the coast and it was just the perfect opportunity because This condo complex, it used to be an apartment complex and they converted them to condos and they had on-site property management. It's like, okay, so this is great. I don't have to worry about the management. I don't have to worry about um, even really paying anyone because they just did this. So, um, you know, I did my research and everything, ended up getting a condo. This is 2009 uh, for $80,000 and the person, it was a short sale. The person owed $220,000 on it. Now, the oh, wow. con- 
Yeah, the condo was probably worth more than the 80,000, but these are depressed markets, right? So um, ended up getting it for 80,000. I kept that condo for about two years. I had two different tenants, $1,100 a month. Um, so it was great. Um, I ended up paying cash for it. Uh, I actually did a loan for my 401k. So I guess you could call that almost like a self-directed uh, 401k, but I just took a loan and then I paid cash for the condo. So um, in my mind, um, and I definitely would not normally recommend, you know, borrowing money from a 401k, but uh, the way that I was approaching it is that I was just investing it in a different way. Like I wasn't taking it to go on a vacation or anything like that or to pay off credit card debt. So it was paid for with cash and it made the transaction a lot easier. And I only had to put about $10,000 in it, but, you know, totally gutted it and everything. And it was basically a brand new condo. Um, Just after a couple of years, it was just, you know, even though I wasn't managing it, I just didn't like it was so illiquid, right? I like stocks because I can sell it anytime I want to. And, you know, you never know. I I had that fear of, you never know when you're going to get that bad tenant. And, you know, if things go wrong, then they'll, they could call the property management, but you're ultimately responsible for it as the um, owner, right? So I just, I just didn't like it. And I, I realized something about myself. Again, that's why I recommend everyone at least try it. So I just realized for myself, I just really wasn't that interested in, you know, owning property like that and and renting it out and being a landlord. Um, So, you know, the market had rebounded pretty good by, I think, I think I had it for like two, maybe three years, but the market had rebounded significantly. So I knew I had, um, you know, I would look at the value of the condo and it went up and up and up. And I finally said, you know, I'm I'm making a good profit here. I think I'm going to go ahead and sell it. And um, I'm glad that ha- I had this experience. And I think I sold it. I think it was like 140000 And then you factor in, you know, the cost for the real estate agent to sell it and all that. So it wasn't a bad experience. It was just I learned something about myself and that I didn't really want to own real estate that way. Yeah. yeah. But good for you. I mean, you made 50 grand ish, right? Plus cash yeah. sold some rent for a couple of years. So probably 75 grand or something. Yeah. So I can't even complain and I'm totally glad that I did it. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Good for you. So Jackie, on this journey, as you've become a millionaire, well, let me first ask you, how old were you, if you're comfortable sharing, when you became a millionaire? Uh, Yeah, I'm happy to share. Um, I was 46 years old when I hit um, a million dollars. And incidentally, that was like what I call my FI number, the the 25 times my expenses. So basically 40,000 times 25 is a million dollars. I was about 46. Awesome. And has that, and maybe not just even the million, but other milestones along the way as you felt like you had some financial freedom a little bit, right? Or savings in the bank or whatever it may be. Did that increase your confidence levels as a person or your happiness levels? Did, you know, obviously it's nice to have that. It's comforting to know you have it. Did it increase happiness levels at all for you? You know, I have to say yes, because I grew up in poverty and and it's just miserable, um, you know, when you're in poverty, you speak to anyone that's poor, they would rather be rich and have money. Um, So I was, you know, it gave me a lot more security. Um, I felt much more safe. I felt like I didn't have to depend on a paycheck. So all those are great, positive feelings. And then on top of that, to have the feeling of now I can do what I want, like having that freedom to, you know, follow my dreams and, and, you know, not worry, whatever projects I work on around financial literacy, if they happen right. to not work out, I'm not going to be in the poor house again. Like I, I, mm-hmm, I don't think mm-hmm. I will, as long as I still have my brain, I don't think I will ever have to go back there again. And luckily I feel like I can actually bring more people up by being where I am. So it, it changed. It did. I mean, it didn't change overnight. It was gradual. And I knew I was going in the right direction. I just didn't expect, I guess, the pivot of actually retiring this early. So that was the big piece for me. And, you know, my my life is still extremely fulfilled. I think it's so great when we can challenge our minds to, you know, be like a blank canvas and have the freedom to say, okay, if I could design my life or design my day, what would it look like? It's just so 
empowering to have that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you there. Do you worry at all that 1.3 or 4-ish where you're at is is not enough? Uh, I mean, not really. I, you know, I'm sure you've seen all the statistics, especially with African-Americans around, you know, wealth and retirement and things like that. Because I know I'm doing more than what the statistics have told me I should be doing and what the demogra- demographics show that even if I lost what I had or lost a part of it or the market goes down, I think that um, I'm still going to be okay. And retiring so young, I think the one thing that gets underestimated is, you know, human capital. So I'm not going to sit around and twiddle my thumbs. And even the stuff I do around financial literacy, more than likely, some of that, you know, will start to bring an income. I mean, I don't have right. to, it's not do or die. Yeah, you're not, your income's not over. Yeah, exactly. Now, if I was 75, then it's probably not likely that I'm going to be doing a whole lot to, to make money. So, so I, I feel okay about it. And, you know, I've gotten, a, you know, I'm willing to take some risk and looking at the reward and the payoff that I'll get, you know, it's just like a, a, a no contest. Yeah. Good for you. Good attitude too. Do, does your, do your family members, siblings, friends know that you're a millionaire or is that, is that secret? Uh, you know, it's not really secret because I guess I, I have one other uh, mission uh, that I've been trying to live by is, you know, trying to remove the taboo of talking about money I mean, the only person that could spend my money is me. So people knowing it, yeah, it's not like it's sitting, you know, um, you know, in my car or anything like that. You know, it's it's invested and it's locked away. But when I was learning about, um, you know, fire and retiring early and financial independence, it was so helpful to me to see real numbers. And I always appreciated the content creators who shared their numbers because that helped me with my math a lot better. So I don't want it to be such a scary topic. I don't want it to be a big secret. So I'm freely sharing these numbers with you guys today. And I appreciate so much of what you guys are doing, talking to the millionaires, every one that you have on I've listened to, and I've learned something from. And if I'm learning something, I can guarantee you so many other people are. So why aren't we having these conversations more? I really want to normalize conversations around money and not be scared to talk about it. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming on, right? It's yeah, not, it's no not about us. It's about you guys. And we appreciate <laughs> you and all the millionaires we've had come on. That's what makes the show successful and helps other people learn. So thank you. I just want to end with some rapid fire questions here before we get into some last mistakes and advice. So <laughs> what's the most expensive car you've ever purchased? You're kind of a car person, right? know if I would say I'm a car person. I do like to drive a luxury car, but I do it the smart way. Um, I get it where it's about three to five years old. I keep my cars for about eight to 10 years. You know, okay. It was this one. Um, I think it was like $28,000. It was for a uh, Lexus SC430 convertible. Oh, wow. And, nice. Yeah. I love that car. <laughs> uh, I, I had, I, but I live in a climate where we get snow and everything. So I used to have two vehicles. I went down to one and I had this convertible and there's no way it was going to work, but I love that. Ve- I never drove a convertible before, but again, that car was uh, paid for and, um, you know, it was mine and, you know, I really enjoyed it. But so that's, that's the one I paid yeah. the most. Do you have <laughs> any debt at all besides credit cards? Um, I, well, I don't have any credit card debt, but I do have um, debt. I have my home. Um, so I opted not to pay off my mortgage uh, because the interest rate is so low. And I just assume keep that um, working in the market. And it's simply just built into my budget. I mean, it, it, you know, I I have almost 80% equity in it now. Um, so I'll just, you know, pay it off as agreed. And anytime I decide I change my mind or something like that, I could go ahead and pay it off. But um, the reasonable debt, you know, doesn't really scare me. Long-term debt doesn't really scare me. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And I didn't mean to insinuate you had credit card debt. I just think everyone <laughs> kick, kick, everybody carries a little balance, you know? Well, no, so. I mean, I 
I generally pay the whole thing off. I mean, the only time I would carry a balance is, is if I have like a 0% offer or something like that. And usually um, it's part of a bigger strategy or something. But yeah, for for as long as I can remember, you know, I pay the entire balance off um, right. every month. Every month. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for you. Yeah, that's what I mean. You carry a balance for two weeks and then you pay it off, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, what items or experiences are worth spending more money on to you? And what has not been worth the money? Yeah. Well, the one thing that's worth the money is my daughter. Um, she's in her twenties now and, um, I just love every time we get together. So sometimes we're getting wings and some beer and other times we might go to a really nice restaurant. It doesn't even matter. It's just the quality time that we Mm -hmm. have together or if we do a vacation or, or do something together. So I just don't ever put a price tag on that. Um, so that's always worth it. So what's not worth it? You know what? I'm so guilty of this. And my daughter has been on me for a long time. I'm one of those people that had cable way too long. I mean, the cable boxes, you know, <laughs> it's not freaking worth it. Um, now I've, I'm finally switched over to the streaming services and, um, I mean, I barely need them anymore because I'm in school now and most of my time is in front of the computer. So, um, the whole idea of cable and, you know, cable has definitely had to shift because um, Mm -hmm. I'm probably one of the Mm -hmm. last people that still had cable service, but that was one thing that was not worth it. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Have you ever used a financial advisor? You know, I have never used a financial advisor. Um, Part of the program that I'm taking, it is for CFPs, um, certified financial planners. Um, So I have a newfound respect for them. Um, If I ever got a financial advisor, definitely I would want him him or her to be a um, CFP. But I was always so interested and curious about my own finances. I could not imagine turning it over to someone else. Mm. So just lastly here, Jackie, what what's your advice or what mistakes have you made to somebody that's in a similar situation? What, what are kind of your parting words and how you could help somebody out? Obviously, you have a tremendous story. You've been extremely successful financially and in life and have a great relationship with your daughter, who I assume is successful as well. So what's your ad- advice to people here? Parting words. Um, I would say, you know, be curious and start with the mindset. Like probably one of the biggest objections I get was that I don't have any money to save. I can barely pay my bills now. Well, to start, if you started out by just getting your mindset right to say, okay, I've listened to this person, their sp- their story spoke to me, or I've been digging and reading about that. And I believe that I can do it. And here's like, the little tweaks I'm going to make every day to get there. But when, when people will ask a similar question, like, you know, can anybody reach fire? Well, the answer is no, because, you know, to have the, the, the means to do it is already hard. And if you don't have the mindset to even want to start down the path, it's going to be very, very difficult. So even when you don't have any money, at least be curious and start digging and figuring out, you know, how an investment works or how to start investing in your 401k, which is how most people start. And then, you know, maybe, you know, start figuring out, okay, what program can I take or what skill can I get to maybe increase my income just a little bit? You know, maybe everyone can't become a millionaire, but you can start on the path only if you, you know, will believe that it's it's possible and start making these small little adjustments as you go. And no matter what, you're going to be able to be at least pushed in the right direction. Awesome. That is great advice. Thank you. Jackie, where can people find you or get in hold of you if, if they want to learn more about you or connect? Okay. They can connect me just by going on my website. Everything's there. Um, it is money letters and the number two.com. So money letters uh, com. And uh, I'd be happy to uh, connect with anyone. And and again, I love you guys' uh, platform. And thank you for helping my mission of, uh, you know, removing the taboo of talking about money. Oh, no. Thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. So again, everybody, that's Jackie, net worth of $1.3 million. Thanks again for coming on the show tonight. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast with Clark Sheffield and Chase Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website at millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.